COVID has been impacting uh, the socioeconomy lately and what has been the government's response. Uh, that's one and uh, one of the key objectives uh, uh, because of which, of course, we had been trying to uh, uh, get time from Dr. Ishtar to join us here and uh, guide us on what's the way forward in the coming rounds uh, of COVID. Now, as we understand, uh, the government's response is, of course, uh, split across four main areas around which we would like to hear today from uh, uh, Ishrat Saab. First, of course, uh, he wanted to uh, discuss today on how the government is responding to uh, the foremost crisis, which is responding to uh, the health uh, as well as the exigencies around uh, uh, health crisis. Second, of course, economic uh, recovery strategies, which the government has. And we do understand that the government is coming up with the fiscal year 2021 uh, budget. Uh, the provincial governments are coming up with their own budgets. And one would really like to hear that uh, almost uh, with two weeks left in uh, the new budgets, which are going to be announced, what would be the federal and provincial priorities going forward. Uh, third is the help around vulnerable groups and response under uh, EHSAS. Uh, and this is what we had requested uh, Dr. Sir to touch uh, upon as well, and we look forward to hearing from him. We do understand that within uh, helping the one within this uh, heading of helping the vulnerable groups, uh, the challenges which, of course, EHSAS as well as the central bank have been facing is around targeting and exclusion, which they've been trying to uh, refine uh, lately uh, with help of, of data as well as uh, uh, improvements to management and information systems uh, around them. Uh, the fourth main area is, of course, uh, how does one uh, uh, foster international cooperation around the subject going forward? We do understand that Pakistan has uh, submitted for a debt relief from G20 as well as federal, uh, as well as friendly countries. And uh, one just wants to hear uh, in today's discussion on, on what will be Pakistan's uh, way forward, uh, number one on the debt relief and what is uh, the response uh, from uh, uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, uh, donors who are helping Pakistan through these uh, difficult times. Uh, and then finally, how do we move uh, on from here in terms of uh, resilience and uh, fitness for an uncertain future. And that's that. That's where uh, institutions such as SDPI and many of the institutions sitting uh, with us today, uh, I, I think we can all uh, sort of come together and help on what sort of resilience at an institutional level, at a policy and regulatory level uh, is, is required, what sort of interventions for uh, resilience may be required going forward uh, in the future rounds of uh, COVID. So this is uh, a brief background uh, in which, of course, we'd like to uh, discuss with all of you and hear from our keynote uh, speaker, Dr. Ishra Tusan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Vakar, uh, for uh, setting uh, the scene, uh, for uh, giving the uh, context. Uh, just uh, uh, beef uh, uh, intro of uh, uh, Dr. Ishtar Tussain. Uh, as you know, the doc Dr. Ishtar Tussain is uh, uh, currently uh, advisor uh, to uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Pakistan uh, with the status of uh, uh, Federal Minister. Uh, he's uh, advising uh, the Prime Minister on uh, austerity and uh, reforms. Uh, and the previous, that is his uh, second uh, stint in uh, the uh, uh, federal ca cabinet. Uh, he was uh, he served as chairman national commission for uh, government reforms for two years uh, from 2006 to 2008 uh, with the status of uh, uh, federal minister. Uh, he has uh, also served as a dean and director of uh, Institute of uh, Business Administration, uh, Karachi. Uh, before that, uh, he served as uh, uh, governor uh, state bank. Uh, of uh, Pakistan, and uh, uh, in uh, 2005, uh, the Banker uh, Magazine of London uh, it declared him as the Central Bank Governor of the Year of uh, for Asia. Uh, before uh, joining uh, State Bank of Pakistan, uh, uh, he had a distinguished career uh, at the World Bank for over two decades. Uh, 
uh, and among the key positions he held at uh, the bank uh, were resident representative to Nigeria, uh, head of the bank's debt and international finance division, uh, chief economist for Africa, uh, and uh, chief economist for East Asia and Pacific region. Uh, and uh, he also became uh, uh, bank's director poverty and uh, social de de department. Uh, and in 1977, uh, uh, he was named the country director for Central Asian uh, Republics. Uh, so uh, uh, his uh, uh, career uh, uh, spans a uh, uh, huge experience, uh, both uh, working with governments, uh, both uh, advising the uh, governments uh, from uh, uh, World Bank, as well as a, a central banker, as well as an academician, uh, and of course, a uh, uh, member of uh, uh, the federal cabinet. So. Uh, uh, one would uh, really like to uh, uh, listen uh, from him, uh, from his experience, uh, uh, what is uh, required uh, in this uh, uh, difficult times uh, without getting into debt trap, uh, but uh, uh, of course, uh, following this quantitative uh, easing uh, in this uh, uh, COVID. Uh, we have uh, uh, guests uh, not only uh, from Pakistan, but also uh, from uh, uh, international guests. So we have uh, uh, two deputy directors from uh, Karik Institute, uh, one from Urmuchi and uh, uh, other uh, from Uzbekistan. Uh, we also uh, have uh, two guests from uh, Australia, uh, one from uh, Australia High Commission and uh, the other from uh, Australian uh, Foreign uh, Service and of course uh, uh, participants uh, from different walks of life uh, from uh, Pakistan. Uh, so, uh, uh, as uh, 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 you know that uh, we are, uh, uh, we have organized this uh, uh, special webinar uh, in the context of uh, uh, what needs to be done uh, to uh, 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 face the challenge of uh, COVID-19 and that is affecting Pakistan's uh, economy. Uh, and of course, one of the questions that appears is uh, uh, quantitative easing uh, versus avoiding uh, uh, debt uh, trap. Uh, so uh, obviously uh, in Pakistan, uh, uh, due to uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, fiscal cushion and lack of uh, uh, resources, uh, uh, we, the government is not able to provide as much relief uh, uh, to the uh, people uh, as it uh, wants to, but uh, even whatever relief it's trying to provide, uh, uh, it would uh, again uh, uh, affect on uh, uh, the uh, debt uh, situation, uh, then uh, slowing down of economy would affect uh, uh, the revenue generation. Uh, we are also expecting some sort of slowdown in uh, remittances. So uh, in, in all of uh, this uh, situation, uh, of course, managing economy is a, a difficult uh, task. But then we know that uh, uh, government has uh, just uh, uh, launched uh, the fourth category of SAS program as well for the jobless uh, uh, workers. Uh, uh, which would be uh, again uh, extremely important. So in this uh, struggle uh, to uh, maintain a balance between lives and livelihoods, uh, your advice is uh, of course uh, extremely important and we want to, to uh, listen uh, from you uh, uh, that uh, what is the uh, way forward? How do you uh, think that uh, uh, private sector uh, can uh, support uh, the government uh, in this uh, uh, difficult uh, task? And uh, uh, what should uh, organizations uh, and think tanks like STPI, uh, what can they do in producing evidences uh, that could inform uh, uh, the uh, policy making in a, a better way. So over to you, Doctor. Thank you very much. I think uh, let me first clarify what the objectives of uh, this government are and what are the priorities. First and the foremost priority is that people who are living below the poverty line and now even above the poverty line because some of them must have fallen back in the poverty line due to the loss of jobs and loss of livelihoods, particularly the daily wage earners, people who are doing hawking, they are doing some odd jobs, they have now no means of uh, financial support. So we decided that our first priority will be to help them out. And therefore, 
so far we have reached 8 million households and if you take a six as the household size that means 48 million people have been directly given cash transfer in my view and that is an empirical evidence from across the world that the best way of assisting them is to provide unconditional cash transfers and that is being done and our target is 12 million so we are still short of 4 million as far as these vulnerable groups the near poor and those who are above the poverty line and we have taken the PMT from 16 to 24 so that people who were not getting any benefits under the previous uh, criteria will now be eligible and that will increase our coverage to 4 million new households. Then the third category is those who are not in our databases and they have applied to the deputy commissioners to the district administration who verify and then we go through the data analytics and we provide them the 12,000 rupees as a grant. So that was the first priority. The second priority is to have our small and medium enterprises some relief in order to carry out their businesses without any disruption. And for that, we have three different schemes. One is the state bank's policy to provide very subsidized loans to the SMEs. And the government of Pakistan is providing 40% risk sharing guarantee so for the first loss. So the banks do not have to bear the entire burden of losses in the future and government is sharing that. And so far we have advanced 40 billion in that respect, but there is no limit. And if need be, if this 40 billion is exhausted, we are willing to put in another amount of money so that we can meet the demand. The third element, which is more difficult for us to manage and to target, was for the labor class. There are people who are not in the national economic, uh, socioeconomic surveys or on our database on the PMT. So we had to cater for the people who were not really eligible under the SRS program or the BIS program, but who have now become jobless because of the coronavirus. We have allocated 75 billion rupees and there is a labor portal which has been established to seek the applicants with some basic information and data about them and after screening and after data analytics we will be providing 12,000 rupees to them. And that we estimate will be another three to four million people. So that in all, if you count 12 million under the SRS category one, two, and three, and labor uh, program in the category four, we aim to reach out to the 16 million household, which is almost 100 million people in Pakistan. This is the largest unconditional cash transfer which has taken place in the history of Pakistan. And I'm not aware of many other countries except Mexico and Brazil where they had the Opojindad and Bolsa Familia where such large scale of transfers have taken place. And thank God we have not heard so many complaints of the leakages. There were some leakages in the beginning but people have been taken to task. And since then there has been, um, I would say, a very targeted uh, interventions. So it is reaching out to the right people. So the people are always saying, oh, we are talking about the poor, 
but we are doing things for the rich. That's not true. As I said, we're reaching out to 100 million people in this country who are below the poverty line or above the poverty line and are quite vulnerable. As far as the big businesses are concerned, the only advantage we have given them is to accelerate their own refunds. This is the money which they had given to the FBR for the sale tax or the income tax or for the custom duty. And we have decided to accelerate that. So this is their own money which we are giving them back so that they have liquidity and they have cash flow so that they can carry out their own you know, businesses. For agriculture, which you, Abid, are very much an expert, we decided that we have to reach out to the small farmers. So the like we have the SME line of credit uh, loan scheme by, by the state bank, we are going to provide the banks with a major subsidy of almost a reduction of 10 percentage points in the interest rate to the farmers below 12.5 acres holding. So it is targeted for those who are actually subsistence farmers. And we are allocating 56 billion rupees for seed subsidy on seed of quality seed on fertilizers, 37 billion dollars uh, rupees will be going for fertilizer subsidy to reduce the price of urea, DAP, and also the potash. And then pesticides for the white fly against cotton, because that has been one of the major problems we are facing, and for small uh, implements and the machinery. So there's a package for reviving uh, agriculture, but the target is again, the small farmer and the subsistence farmers so that they can benefit from it. The other area of uh, concern for us is the whole question of job creation. Now we know that under the Corona, a lot of economic activity has actually dwindled and therefore, we expect that joblessness and unemployment rates will increase. So we have revived the construction sector, which is highly labor intensive, but at the same time, it has linkages with almost 40 allied industries, whether it is the steel or the cement or it is wooden products or it is the ceramics and the tiles and everything, they're all linked with this. So if you revive the construction industry and we have given a hefty package of incentives which have never been given in the history of Pakistan, you would be able to create jobs not only in the construction industry itself, but in the allied industries and also in the outlets which are selling these products. So the wholesale and the retail trade sectors, the transport sectors, as well as the industrial sectors would have a huge contribution in creating jobs or at least avoiding the loss of the jobs. So that is our strategy and it is a very well-crafted strategy which has the preferences and the priority for 100 million people who are not able to afford their livelihoods or their daily uh, lives. So that is in fact our uh, current program of uh, economic stimulus and protecting the socially vulnerable groups. Uh, Abhi, thank you. Any questions? I'm prepared to answer any questions you have. So uh, your Thank you very much, uh, uh, Doctor. Uh, as a governor, uh, uh, State Bank, of course, uh, and uh, uh, you are a pioneer uh, in uh, supporting. I cannot, the I cannot hear you clearly. You are not very clear. I cannot hear you. Yes. Doctor, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, it is better. The first time you were very clear, but now there's something to happen. Uh, let me switch off my video if it helps in uh, 
Yeah. So, uh, uh, Doctor, this was uh, regarding uh, microfinance. Uh, uh, of course, as yeah. uh, you are uh, uh, one of uh, the supporters uh, for uh, microfinance, uh, 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 institutionalizing it and uh, using it as an uh, as a vital uh, instrument uh, for uh, uh, Pakistan's uh, poor and, of course. Uh, or in other countries where you had been advising uh, as part of uh, your uh, World Bank uh, career. Uh, now, while we can see uh, quite a few uh, stimulus packages uh, uh, refinancing from uh, uh, the central bank in Pakistan, uh, is there a, a, any uh, package that could uh, uh, cater uh, the needs for uh, microfinance uh, uh, borrowers, those who have been borrowing through uh, different RSPs or uh, through other uh, uh, instruments? Yeah, I think uh, I'm a great supporter and actually I uh, take pride in bringing in microfinance under the regulatory framework of the central bank, which is now being applied else elsewhere. So I'm very much interested that the microfinance institutions do participate in this economic stimulus package. And I've been talking to the State Bank of Pakistan for that. There are two uh, major difficulties. One is that the central bank only regulates the microfinance banking institutions, which is a small subset of the total. While some microfinance institutions for nonprofit are regulated by SCCP. Now, central bank can only provide any loaning facility or refinancing facility or deferment uh, of the principal facility to the microfinance banks, but they are only a subset. So the question arises, how do we reach out to the microfinance institutions? For example, the RSPN is a network um, throughout the country, but it has only a bank uh, which is under the central bank. So that is a question which is being examined and explored, and that's why it is taking some time. But I personally am a great supporter, and in the cabinet and the ECC, I have been making this pitch that 7 million borrowers are now the microfinance, and some of them are entrepreneurs and small traders and small business people. So we should try to reach out to them. So this is work in progress. And as soon as we are able to refine this concept and have it operationalized, I think uh, we would announce it. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, my next question is again uh, uh, about uh, the role of uh, uh, Central Bank and that is regarding uh, the refinancing uh, package uh, that uh, the central bank has uh, announced uh, as well as, uh, as uh, some of uh, the loans which were to be given to the uh, industry uh, uh, small and medium entrepreneurs now uh, some of the media reports that uh, tell us that uh, commercial banks they are not very keen on lending uh, because uh, they are not able to uh, uh, amend their uh, uh, borrowing requirements so they are asking for collateral and they are asking for uh, all other uh, due diligence which uh, should be there in normal times but perhaps in uh, this uh, uh, covid time uh, some of uh, uh, the uh, needy uh, organizations and uh, some of uh, the uh, needy industries they are not able to uh, fulfill so is there any way around about it no i think uh, you were wrong in the beginning when the state bank had announced this scheme without the first loss being borne by the government of Pakistan, the banks were very reluctant because they were going to get 100% loss if the default takes place. But as soon as we modified the scheme of the state bank and gave them a 40% risk sharing uh, guarantee on the first loss, I think we also told the banking industry that you can only use up to 60% of the value of loan for collateral because 40% is guaranteed by 
the government of Pakistan. So I think the banks are now looking at the collateral requirements in a different way as they were doing it in the beginning. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Now, in order to do all this, of course, uh, uh, revenue is required. Uh, uh, fiscal cushion is uh, required. So uh, one of the questions that uh, arises is that uh, how would Pakistan be able to repay uh, all the external uh, assistance that it is uh, uh, getting uh, uh, to uh, cope with this uh, COVID? So, of course, uh, we know that government of Pakistan is actively pursuing uh, uh, this uh, debt rescheduling and uh, debt relief from uh, uh, multilateralism from uh, uh, G20. Uh, but uh, uh, what about this uh, debt sustainability? Because we know we are uh, uh, also in this extended fund well, facility. I think, uh, look at the debt mature. Our total debt is almost 50% to our domestic debt, which includes the facility also. So we have to look at the composition of our external uh, debt. Uh, there are three main, another 30%, and then you will have some non-Paris club bilaterals, uh, which will be Saudi Arabia and China and others. And then we have almost 20, 25% of the bonds and the commercial short-term loans. Now, multilaterals cannot be actually uh, rescheduled or reprofiled. So we have to work with our bilateral Paris Club and non-Paris Club bilaterals in order to not only get deferment, which they have given us for one year, but also reduce the net present value of those debts and Stagger them over a longer period of time with a grace period so that in these initial stages where we have resource constraints, we are not burdened with the debt problem. So this is what we are trying to work on. And we hope that the G20 has already been very supportive of the debt deferment for the poor countries, including Pakistan, and the next step is that we have to make out a case, especially the low income and the lower middle income countries for a reduction in the net present value and a staggering of the debt with the grace period and a reduced interest rate. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sub. Uh, I know uh, most of uh, the discussion today is taking place in the context of uh, COVID. But before I uh, ask uh, the participants to ask their question, I was uh, quite uh, uh, curious to uh, get benefit of your presence here and uh, uh, get updated uh, about uh, your excellent work that uh, uh, you have uh, uh, initiated around uh, institution reform. So uh, we have uh, heard uh, the glimpse of, uh, about them, but it would be uh, nice to hear it uh, from you uh, as well. So if you can uh, touch upon some of uh, those. Yeah, thank you, because that's my bread and butter job. This what I'm doing is, uh, you know, voluntary in addition to help the government and the uh, anti-corona, you know, strategy. So my major, uh, before March, my major aim and thrust was to prepare a package of reforms uh, for uh, reforming the government and also the civil services. So we have a value chain of civil service policies. And our starting proposition is that if you don't look at the value chain in an integrated, holistic manner, and you tinker it with one or two components, you're not going to get the desired results. So we start with induction and recruitment. We go to training. We then go for performance management system. Then we go to career planning and promotion policy. Then we go to compensation. And finally, to the retirement, both early retirement and regular report. So in the induction and training, we are trying to bring about some alignment with the job requirements and your demonstrated competence of that domain knowledge. 
For example, if I'm going for a police service in Pakistan, I have to appear in two subjects, criminology and criminal law, in order to be eligible to become a police officer. Similarly, if I want to go audit and accounts, I should have taken two papers on accounting and auditing and financial management. So this is not happening right now. So we are proposing to the government that there should be some domain knowledge, expertise demonstrated at the time of induction. You may be an MBBS doctor or you may be a PhD in uh, English literature, but if you have taken these two optional subjects, then you will become eligible. Otherwise, you won't be. So that is um, the first step. The second step is that we have 23,000 officers who do not belong to the Carter services. They do not come through the Central Superior Services Examination, but they are scientists, they are agriculturists, they are financial analysts, they are engineers, they are doctors, you name them. And we haven't taken care of them, neither in their training or capacity building or refreshing their knowledge or in their career path. So we have decided, the government has approved this in the cabinet, that now we will be having a whole plan for training and capacity building of these 23,000 officers. It's a huge task because they have never gone to any training course. But given that we are entering the knowledge economy in the 21st century, we have to invest in their knowledge building and keeping up with the latest developments in their fields. The third aspect is on the performance management. Today, Abid, you know this, that everybody gets a outstanding report or excellent report. So we are unable to distinguish at the time of rewards or at the time of promotion as to who deserves it, because this is an annual confidential report, which is highly subjective. So we're moving away from that, and that cabinet has approved to a performance contract. The performance contract will be between the prime minister and the minister, and between the minister and the secretary, and down below. There will be objectives for the year. There will be measurable, quantifiable, key performance indicators, and both the reporting officer and the reportee will sign on that. And after six months, they will revisit whether those objectives are still valid or not. And if they are valid, then the KPIs remain intact. And after 12 months, they evaluate the progress which has been made against the KPIs. And then there is a bell curve that only 20% will be categorized outstanding, 60% will be satisfactory, and 20% will be below average. So the rewards will be for those who are outstanding, they will get double that of the satisfactory. And those who are below average will get no reward at all, no increments. So we are linking performance with compensation. The fourth element is promotion policy. Now we have a promotion policy which is based on seniority. We're saying no, it will be based on your performance, your training outcomes, whether you did well in the training and your reports from the training were quite good, or you have made certain additional academic qualifications. For example, you've gone and got a degree in, let us say, in civil engineering from a good university, we should reward you at the time of the promotion. So those parameters are now being taken into account as far as the promotion is concerned. And the Central Selection Board will have 14 or 15 members. So the biases are actually nullified. And this is a collective judgment of the board which will decide who gets promoted or not. The fifth element is a compensation. Right now, 95% of our uh, workforce is in grades 1 to 16, and they get much higher uh, wage 
wages and salaries as compared to their counterparts in the private sector. But we have only 5% who are 17 to 22. As I said, these are very specialist people and also the Carter officers and their salary and compensation are much lower than the counterparts in the private sector. So we want to redress this imbalance and we want to increase the compensation package of the officers and the specialists and reduce the size and the package of the people who are, you know, at the lower carters because they're not making that much contribution. And finally, there's a retirement policy. We just announced an early retirement policy where if your performance was not good for three years on average, or you were superseded by the promotion board, or you were found guilty of corruption or malpractices, and you were inquired and proven, then you will be asked to retire early if you're not dismissed. There are other penalties like dismissal, but this is a penalty that some people may not be found guilty of uh, you know, very heavy punishment. So this is a re easy way out for weeding out the dead wood who are not actually making any contribution. But we're not going to penalize them uh, by withholding their uh, retirement benefits. So we're going to give them the benefits. So that is uh, the whole package. On the retirement, we are thinking of moving away from pay as you go to define contribution so that people contribute both um, government as well as the employee. And we invest that into a fund, which then buys financial instruments. And at the time of the retirement, you get this money without any major burden on the government itself. So this is the value chain, which we are now gradually introducing in the federal government. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sab. Uh, that brought me to uh, two supplementary questions uh, on it. Uh, one is about uh, uh, the future of jobs now, as the uh, World Health Organization is uh, warning us that we would have to live with the COVID-19 maybe for a longer period of time, which may necessitate working from home and remote uh, offices, uh, which would mean that perhaps uh, some of uh, the positions, uh, especially at the lower cadre, uh, we may have to uh, either amend them or uh, to uh, say them goodbye uh, to make productive use of them. So uh, uh, what do you uh, foresee the future of uh, a job in Pakistan, uh, especially in the civil service uh, uh, that would get affected by COVID? And the second was about uh, 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 the next uh, selection board. So uh, will your recommendation be applicable to the next selection board, which is due now? or? Uh, uh, the next election board would be uh, done as uh, normal and once uh, the cabinet and the, uh, approves all this uh, recommendation then it would be applicable so when would it be applicable no, the motion no, the last point you raise it has already been approved by the cabinet so the selection board will now evaluate people according to the new rules so that is already done even before covid we had the e government project which has been lingering on for a long time and we said that we would have no paper files anymore we would have all shared filing we will work from remote accesses we will have websites which will be fully loaded with all the rules regulations uh, laws um, manuals and all the data so you don't need the lower staff to put up the PUC, as they call it, and create a file. Uh, you have a uh, idea about a certain point. You shoot it in the file, and I look at it. And simultaneously, many other people are looking. So we were trying to reduce the vertical hierarchy, but increase the horizontal uh, working protocol which is that if you are a secretary, instead of having six peons and assistants and others, you would have one or two staff officers who are highly qualified to assist you because e-governance allows you the platform for looking at 
all the information which you need and you make decisions in the light of that. So even before COVID, we were moving on this and our target is uh, being met by 14 ministries who have reached that point, but there are other ministries which are lagging behind and we are pushing them in order to meet the targets. So that e-government project is already on the, on, on the way. After the COVID, our experience is that the fewer people who come here, the better efficiency is. So that gives us another chance to look at our uh, manpower requirements and the composition of that manpower to look at what really under the post-COVID uh, scenario we would be able to uh, retain and what we can retrain and what we can actually dispense with. But at this moment, we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, severe or dismiss or uh, let anybody go because the employment situation is already bad. So we would keep them in the surplus pool and we will try to retrain them for the kind of skills which we need. And if they retire, then we're not going to renew those positions. Now, so that is the idea. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shat. Last question from me, and then I'll go to uh, the participants. Uh, uh, and uh, this is about uh, uh, regional cooperation. Uh, you see COVID, many says that uh, it is time to say goodbye to globalization and now the countries, they would have to take care of uh, uh, their own uh, issues, supranationalization. Uh, others say that uh, uh, without uh, connectivity or without being interdependent, we will not be able to take care of the challenges and issues which are being uh, posed by uh, COVID. So what is, uh, in your opinion, uh, is the future of uh, regional cooperation and the future of uh, globalization. What sort of world do you see after COVID-19? I personally discern a feeling of nationalism and nation states asserting themselves. And the forces which led us to regional cooperation and globalization, I think those forces are going to be receding. That is my feeling. We already had the problems on the migration of people from the low-income countries to the developed countries. That had created a lot of resentment. Now, the supply chain disruptions in the COVID era has given rise to a feeling among a lot of people in the countries that this dependence on other countries to get your intermediate goods, your components, your raw materials is actually hurting us. So there will be a greater move for what I call is the national supply chain nurturing rather than depending on your neighbors or your region or the other countries. And I think that will be a setback for economic growth and for job creation because the nation state is a very small segment of the global economy. Even China, which has 1.2 billion people, has benefited in, in enormously by the export and import sector. And 20% of the GDP is created by the exports. They could have said we are a large domestic market, but look at their history. It is their opening up and trade liberalization, which has really created China what it is today and reduced the poverty. So we are, I think for the time being at least, as a aftermath of COVID, going to be more inward looking rather than outward looking, which I, as a firm believer, in trade and regional cooperation and globalization find it very uncomfortable. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ishrat. And uh, now I'll uh, uh, go to the uh, participants. If you, uh, those of you who would like to ask any question, if you can uh, uh, 
uh, post directly on the chat box uh, or you can uh, switch on your mics. I would get an idea who would like to ask uh, the question and uh, we can have a moderated discussion. Uh, so uh, any active mics who would like to ask uh, uh, questions? Uh, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal and then Dr. Alia Khan. Uh, Dr. Salikum, uh, thank you so much for your uh, highly enlightening uh, discussion. Um, uh, my question is about uh, the vision of uh, Pakistan's government to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, so uh, we are already, you know, far away from uh, uh, those goals of uh, sustainable development, but especially with the advent of uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, um, the situation uh, regarding the achievement of the sustainable development goals has got uh, worsened. Uh, poverty has increased. Uh, we are in a recession. We were already in recession. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, environmental quality was very uh, poor in Pakistan before the uh, advent of this crisis. Uh, so, but uh, there is a positive impact of this situation on environmental quality. Uh, but uh, after uh, the uh, COVID crisis is over, so uh, how we can be, uh, you know, uh, integrating uh, our, uh, uh, you know, national. Uh, uh, strategy uh, with our, uh, you know, policy of uh, environmental uh, protection. I think that's not only a peculiar Pakistani problem. This is a problem for all, you know, developing countries. My suspicion is that we have to watch the situation as it emerges during next one to two years, and then the UN and the international community will have to take decisions that we have to revisit the SDGs. And for example, the environmental goals can be achieved much quicker because the quality of uh, air has improved a great deal. And that is going to be a positive. On the poverty and joblessness, they may decide that we cannot reach the goals in 2030. They may go to 2035 or something. So I think the situation is quite fluid at this stage. And I don't think anybody in the national community would insist that we adhere to the original goals, which did not envisage such a devastation to the global economy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alia Khan and then Tahir Dinsa. Ji, uh, Dr. Ishrat. It was very nice to hear your uh, talk. Uh, my question is, uh, basically um, regarding informality. Informality of economies has cropped up as the most striking feature in terms of uh, handing out emergency um, cash relief uh, to, for example, jobless workers and also support to SMEs who are mainly operating in the informal economy. I would like to hear your views on how much uh, impetus is that for the government to start thinking seriously of introducing some kind of formalization measures for the SMEs and for the workers who are working in the informal economy? Because uh, in that way, it would be easier to have targeted interventions rather than uh, you know first going through the pains of having to register them and then uh, rolling out the interventions thank you very much thank you alia but you know that our national socioeconomic registry which carries out almost a census of all the households is going to be completed it was to be completed in 2020, but now it will be postponed because of the uh, co uh, COVID-19. And that has a huge database. It is targeted database. What is the population uh, distribution 
among the different provinces, different districts, and what is their PMT score? As I said, we have a data from 2010-11, which goes back to the people who are at the PMT score of 24. So we are covering almost 100 million people or uh, you know 16 million households. So we have already captured that and that's why we are so lucky that we have the targeted uh, subsidies. We're going to use this platform after we have got the survey done for electricity consumption subsidies, for the wheat uh, ATA floor subsidies, for gas subsidies, because this is a huge reservoir of information verified and validated by third parties, which we can use. So I don't think Pakistan is lagging behind. Actually, it is ahead of many countries as far as capturing the informal sector is concerned. And I think uh, this survey, if it is updated every five years, it has all the characteristics and attributes. It has the data on gender. It has the data on the source of uh, income. It has the data on housing. It has data on their health and education. So it is a very rich reservoir, which we can use. Thank you, Dr. Um, would you uh, yeah. comment just uh, just briefly on the data on small and medium enterprises because that is something that uh, really the registry has not been updated since the last economic census that was carried on. Just briefly. We are going to go to for an economic census. That is where we will capture the information. So economic census was planned, but now I think it has been postponed because of the emergency, but I think we have to go to economic census. But let me give you the good news. This portal on labor, which we are asking the information, is being verified. And this three to four million people who are working in the SMEs will become part of our national uh, database for the SMEs and for the informal sector. Thank you. Uh, Tahir Dinsa and then Mr. Iskandar Abdullah. And yeah, I think uh, we are very happy to hear, Dr. Uh, on uh, various subjects, of course, uh, updating us also on the government's efforts to uh, to, to meet the challenges uh, presently being faced. But I think the uh, issue of uh, institutional reform, as Dr. Saab has explained, is very good. I think we are very happy to hear his uh, very, pro very, very positive and progressive approach towards the reforming of civil service. And I think some of the policies that he has described would help us in specialization of the civil service, which in my view is extremely important. But I think the issue of uh, some training of the in of the in service uh, civil servants, and then I think the appointment and the transfer and uh, posting policies, which are uh, totally uh, neutralizing the uh, the the concept of uh, specialization. That I think uh, has to be. Uh, I'm, I'm sure your policy perhaps has uh, has uh, sort of uh, uh, has uh, is uh, imbibed that uh, issue. But if you could uh, let us know, because I would like. Uh, I personally may recommend that in specialized jobs in the civil service, and that's based on my own experience uh, of that, is that uh, one should not be moved away from the post specialized post for. For I mean, before five, at least five years of uh, of uh, of working in that uh, particular post. So, but I think um, your uh, already the policies that you have explained is leading towards uh, specialization. But I think we could perhaps strengthen this specialization of the civil servants, which is extremely necessary in the present day. Now, I think you are right, but we are not taking this so-called dichotomy between the generalist versus the specialist. We are saying that we will combine the comparative strengths of both the generalists and the specialists to get the desired optimal results. So what we are planning to do is that after grade 19, any government servant, whether in the province, autonomous body, or in the federal government, ministry, carter, ex-carter, can compete 
for the jobs are 20 to 22 in four clusters. One will be the economic management cluster. One will be the administrative general management cluster. One will be social sector cluster and one will be the technical cluster. So you will rotate if you are selected within those ministries. So there will be eight or 10 ministries in each cluster. So you will be transferred from one post to another within that cluster. So if you are in economic management, one day you will be in planning, the other day you will be in industries, the third day you will be in finance or economic affairs, but you will not jump from the economic management towards religious affairs or to interior. So that is what we are planning to do, but this is not yet been approved. This is still a proposal by our task force and we will have to present it to the cabinet for their approval, but this is uh, the approach which we want to take it for a combination, what I call as a hybrid approach between the specialist and the generalist for improving our economic policy and our national policies. Uh, let me give a chance to Mr. Skandar Abdullah Tahir. You can fix your uh, mic issue. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I think that was very enlightening. Uh, presentation from your side I think still if even globalization is declining mutual learning between neighboring countries are very uh, needed and helpful so thank you for highlighting I, my question is actually out of uh, national uh, plans but rather regional you know there were big plans on energy trade and energy exchange between Pakistan and Central Asia and there are many uh, infrastructure have been planned to be developed uh, what in your assessment uh, fate of these plans uh, are they will delayed because of COVID-19 and financial shortcomings what do you see a future of energy trade and uh, economic cooperation between Central Asia and Pakistan thank you for your response well uh, we have two regional projects one is the CASA which uh, provides us electricity from Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan to Pakistan. And the other one is the Tur Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, CAPI uh, gas pipeline. Now, before the COVID-19, the prime minister himself was taking a lot of interest and in trying to resolve some of the difficulties and the problems in the way of these projects. But since then, everybody's attention has been diverted towards the national problems in the aftermath of the COVID-19. But let me assure you that as soon as the things normalize, we would go back actually to these two projects and see that they are completed uh, expeditiously. Thank you, Dr. Tahir. You can try again, and then I also have Ambassador Tariq Karim from Bangladesh with us. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, Dr. Sab, salam alaikum. I, I still I still remember the last time the Pakistan debt was reprofiled when you were at the helm of affairs and Shaukat Aziz was the finance minister, and we had a large support from the West, from the US. Now. At the time of negotiating that IMF package, there was resentment, and the Mike Pompeo was uh, on record saying that it should not be paid back to the China. And now we are working very close to the Chinese on Bhasha Dam. Do you think if we go for the bilateral rescheduling, especially for the Paris Club and other rescheduling, the support would be there? And the second, quickly, probably to, if that is reprofiled, last time, bulk of that was wasted in consumerism, uh, cars and everything, because the finance minister has a deep inkling into that. Do you think if this happens this time, it should be linked to some sort of strategic investment as well? Thank you. Well, Tair, I'm a little bit surprised because you are an economic journalist and you have spent all your time on numbers. If you look at the numbers, Pakistan's investment rate had never gone up to 23, 24%, except in the period between 2000 and 2007. So this whole myth that we were going for consumerism is 
totally fallacious because today the consumer, the consumption in Pakistan is 85%. At that time, the consumption, total government as well as the private, was only 75, 76%. What really gave rise to this impression of consumerism is that we opened up the lines of credit for consumer financing. Now, nobody is rich enough to buy a car, but they can pay the installments for replacing their you know, transport expenses by paying for their motorcycle or for the motor car, and they will own it. Similarly, without going for you know, rent, they can use a rental income in order to pay for the mortgage. And that gives a flip to the whole industry. Industry needs demand. If you don't have a demand, then you will not produce and no investment will take place. So there's a greater link between demand creation and industrialization. And that is why our investment ratio was quite you know, high. People do blame shock of disease for this, but this is a standard economic theory that you have to create a demand for goods and services before investment can take place. And that's why cement, which was only 9 million tons at that time, Today, it has gone up to 45 million tons because the demand was created and that demand will continue with the expansion of the cement industry, which is exporting. So I wanted to, you know, disabuse you of this particular argument that, you know, consumerism is something which is a dirty word, which is not. Now, coming to the debt reprofiling, that time, Pakistan, was given that debt reprofiling because our debt to GDP ratio was almost 100% and our external debt burden was so high that we could not service our debt. So the reprofiling was done under the auspices of the Paris Club and IMF program, we supported this as a part of that particular strategy. Right now, the G20 has given this across the board for 75 countries. So unless the G20 changes its views and gives a debt reprofiling, which is the reduction in the net present value of the debt, I don't think Pakistan will be able to get it. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ambassador Tariq Karim. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Abed. Uh, I was caught up in another meeting and that ran over time. Ishad Bhai, Assalamu alaikum. I got the fact of your remarks and uh, uh, where you were talking about uh, nation states sort of closing in the uh, prospects of cooperation, whether regional or global, seems to be taking a back seat or has been pushed to the back seat. That's my fear also. Uh, however, I think even out of this adversity, there is a scope, a window of opportunity for us to, for the, at least the regional states to look at each other because it is a common challenge. This is an existential thing. Uh, Bangladesh, for instance, the economy, until four months ago, we were all thumping our chest and saying we are going to get 7%, 8%, even the ADB it was uh, you know patting us on the back and then suddenly it is taken away uh, we, our position is that uh, uh, our economy is largely exposed based uh, more than 81 percent of export revenues comes from one sector alone and that has taken huge hit uh, the demand side has completely plummeted now some factories are open, but we are running at 20%. So we will have this uh, almost insurmountable problem, it seems to me, of a hugely excess capacity. They are stuck with what they have. They have to renegotiate. They are under pressure. Uh, workers are being laid off. So that's one aspect. Number two, our migrant labor abroad, particularly in the Gulf countries and in Southeast Asia, very large numbers. Uh, there, 
Yes. Many of them will be coming back. Many coming back from the Middle East will not be going back. Uh, they have lost their savings. The foreign exchange remittances which came in are almost equal to our foreign exchange reserves. So that's going to take a huge hit. Uh, one, uh, I think Dr. Alia mentioned, asked about the informal sector. Our informal sector is huge. Uh, uh, and the informal sector and the service sector. Now the government is scrambling to try and meet the poorest of the poor. We were very proud of the achievements we had achieved in putting people out of poverty. Now I think as many got more have been pushed back into it. And, and so these are common challenges we have to face. And I think the unique challenges that we have to face is A, uh, uh, health security, food security. Food is not a problem. We have more than sufficient for at least six months. However, the domestic supply chains have been disrupted. Now, how do we get them back and make sure that the domestic supply chains are, are reorganized? Uh, similarly, I think uh, we we, uh, we are expecting a cyclone to hit us in the next couple of days. The government has scrambled and said, whatever crops you have on the ground, they are 80% ready for harvesting, harvest prematurely. Otherwise, they will all be gone. Okay, so we will constantly, other challenges will be coming on top of this. And I think here there is a golden opportunity for us to cooperate at least on uh, uh, security, food security, uh, some sort of economic security measures that are regional. So I think, yes, the nature of global globalization is going to be redefined. It, it's not going to be uh, victors dictating to the vanquished. There has to be some sort of a consensual approach to arriving at a point where everybody, there, there is a sense of equity and, and equality. Uh, but in the meantime, the building blocks have to be at the regional level. And, and they can start at the smaller scales and become more ambitious. Uh, I agree that there will be a tendency first to look inwards, because I think first you have to set your own house in order as uh, quickly as possible, uh, because the problems of which could come, you know, we I see a new class of beggars now. And these are not the docile, weak, submissive beggars. These are people forced into begging, uh, who have been forced to abandon the dignity because they are driven by hunger and they don't have the money to buy food. Okay. Uh, Threads on the government, and this will be a challenge for many governments, not just us. If they cannot control it, it will spill into social unrest. And if that social unrest goes, we don't know where that dynamics is going to take us. It will have political consequences domestically as well as regionally. So I just wanted to share this. Aishan Bhai, I apologize. I did the bulk of your talk. I hope I will share. Uh, the role of it uh, with, uh, with us. Yes, th th thank you, uh, Doctor. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ishrit, for uh, sparing time. Just very quickly, uh, we understand that for the upcoming budget, revenue collection would be uh, a major challenge going into fiscal year 21. So I understand that there are th th there's a lot of uh, turnover at FBR as well, but alongside reforms are also being introduced at the federal and provincial revenue authorities for the next year. So if you could just highlight on what, what would be the fallback plan to sort of augment uh, the revenues, we already have a target uh, given by the IMF as well. Thank you. I don't think we want to burden um, the existing taxpayers anymore because they are already paying up to the peak, I, in my view. So the whole exercise of FPR reforms and the integration between the provinces and the federal government is to use the databases in an intelligent manner and through data analytics to find out the people who are outside the data the existing uh, text base and bring them in. So the whole effort is on automation, database integration, and bringing in third party information into the FBR database. So I think the effort would be to tap these resources of, uh, in order 
to identify the taxpayers who have not either filed or they have filed, but they have not done according to the calculations. So this is the uh, attempt that for every one individual, the FBR would present a tax return on the basis of the information which they have on the salaries, on the rents, or whatever income they have. And then the taxpayer would be asked whether this tax return is valid for him or her or not. And then they can come back with this. So this self-assessment will become the norm. There will be no interaction between a taxpayer and tax collector. So that is the attempt of the whole you know, automation exercise. Uh, thank you, Doc, uh, Doc Saab. Uh, and uh, there's uh, one question that I uh, received uh, through SMS. Uh, a journalist wanted to know whether uh, the next meeting of uh, Central Selection Committee is going to happen soon or it's being delayed due to COVID-19. Well, um, I'm not the right person. It is the establishment division which convenes this meeting. So for him, it is... Uh, you know, convenient to go and ask the establishment secretary. Uh, I don't convene those meetings. I'm just a member of the board. Thank you, Dr. Ishit, uh, for uh, uh, this uh, very interactive session. Uh, you enlightened us on uh, uh, various aspects, uh, not only economy, but institution reforms to uh, regional uh, cooperation uh, and uh, uh, much more life uh, uh, amidst uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, we, we are uh, grateful to uh, your time, sparing your time, and of course to the participants. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Abed. It was a pleasure. And thank your participants to ask me all these very pertinent questions. And it was a great learning experience for me also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.